Uh, we always look to be refreshed, right, in the presence of the Lord. This is that psalm talks about. We pass through the valley. Um, and this is a place, right, the Grand Valley. It's a place we need that refreshing water that's now going through the canals. Not only did we celebrate Easter last week, but we also have the canals throughout the Grand Valley. I have this uh, tradition that at some point during the day on whatever the canals are going to be filled, I like to go up to the headwaters there along in Colorado and kind of see it coming in new into the canals. To me, it, it just... Um, it's a picture of life, right? New life coming into the valley and how green things start to become. And, and it reminds me of, of what happens spiritually when we make space for God to work in our lives, that we're making room for, as Jesus described it, rivers of living water to flow, to be able to move. And this is part of what you're doing this morning, what we're doing together. We're making space for God to move and work in our lives. And we really believe that, that that's part of what Sunday is about, part of what gathering with other believers is about, is we're pushing back against all of that stuff. Any of you ever feel like you have things crowding in on your life, ever? <laughs> you know, pushing in, pushing in. And life can get really small. Like, if it's just you and what concerns you and the things that are happening in your life, not that you're small, but life can begin to get really focused in on just all these things that are troublesome and difficult. And what happens when we begin to worship and we get around others is perspective. It pushes back against all of that crowding. And I firmly believe that's why God said, listen, you need a rest. You need a rest. You need a day where it's not like every other day. You need to push that stuff back and have a day that is unto God. Because God has an amazing way of refocusing our lives and shifting our attention from just our stuff and our world to Him and what matters to Him, what really brings us life. And so it just changes our focus for our life. So thank you for being here. I know I say that a lot and I repeat that, but I think it's really important. I think it's important for you. It's important for us that you're here, that you're part of that. Um, you're, you're an important part of why we, why we gather together. <coughs> Well, I'm going to talk this morning about idols and images, and uh, it sounds really serious, and it is, but it's, but it's also very inviting. It's a picture of what God calls us to as followers of Christ, and that in, in the beginning of Scripture, in Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, the book of the Bible, the first book of the Bible, it just calls us into this place, and the image, or the, the picture that he's giving us is to be image bearers of God. That we are in relationship with him and we are called to be image bearers of God. And so when I talk about idols and images, what I'm going to be focusing on is this idea of how easy it is for us to be drawn into this idea of instead of us being image bearers of God, what we try to do oftentimes is take God and form him into the image of things that are on the earth or in the, form, in the image of mankind and people. We flip it. It's just the, the tendency that we have is we want to see God imaged in our world, in people or things, and God is saying, no, let's turn that around. I want you to see yourself in me. I don't want you to try to take me and form me into the image of things in, of this world and of the earth. So we're going to take some time to, to do that, and then after a little bit, we'll receive, uh, receive communion. At the end of the service, um, just as a, as a heads up, we're looking forward to being able to pray. Not looking forward to it. It's kind of a, <laughs> a sad thing. We're going to be praying for Josh and Harold Oaks. They're, he's going to be moving here and here soon after um, they have a transition in their life. And so if you want to join with us, we'll be back in the prayer room right at the end of the service. We'd love to pray over them. It's our practice. What we like to do is we believe that the church, um, God has purposes and plans when we go different places. It's not just us choosing things in life. We believe people get sent out. Like we want to pray over them as they go. And so if you want to join us in that, we'll be in the prayer room right at the end of the service. So let me pray now, and then we're going to look at Exodus 20. So again, thank you, Lord, for 
your scripture, uh, for the word we believe is uh, like food to us. <laughs> we we uh, flourish when we take in scripture and we take in the life that you give to us through the scriptures because it's not just the words on the page that we're receiving, it's your spirit speaking through the scriptures that are bringing us life. And so as you speak to us, as you minister to us this morning, I pray you'd give our attention, you'd help our focus be on ways that we can truly be fully alive in you, Jesus. We can truly be image bearers. Help us to hear the scripture, but help us then to internalize it in such a way that we just become more alive, more full of joy, more full of um, the, the, the life and the presence that you have for us here on earth, even as it is in heaven above. We thank you for Jesus. Amen. 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 Exodus chapter 20. When we, we talk about Exodus, uh, just to give it perspective, it's the Israelites who are coming out of, bringing this part of Exodus, the Israelites are coming out of uh, slavery in Egypt, and they have lived 400 years, so, you know, that's older than our, than our nation, right? So, so we can't really even have a great picture of that, but 400 years, they've lost their identity. Whoever they were as a people, they've now assumed the role and the identity as slaves, as, as doers, as your, their only worth, their only value is whatever they can produce. And um, they, they don't have a national identity. They don't really know who they are except they've been slaves. And they're not worth, um, they, they get the dreads. They're not worth anything. And so as they come out of Egypt, um, they have this pause. God delivers them from the hands of their Egyptian masters brings them up to Sinai, and there's a pause here before they go across the desert and into a new land. God is re-imprinting himself on the people of Israel. He is, he is helping them understand who they are called to be. And it's such a great picture for us, too, and what, what God is asking of us in the life of Christ. And it's a really good image for us to see ourselves at, in the role of the people of Israel, what happens to us when we live without Christ, and then when we come to Christ, and how he wants to help us understand our identity. So this is where we're coming to in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, is that God is speaking to them about who they are called to be. And this will help us understand a little bit about idols and images. We mostly look at this for the Ten Commandments. We put the Ten Commandments up. But I want us to see more than just a list of rules. I want us to see what God is calling us to. Exodus 21 through 7 is, is all that I'm reading. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them, or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Okay, so that's just a portion of the Ten Commandments. But those first, uh, first verses of the Ten Commandments, the first part of the Ten Commandments, have a lot to do with just how we image God and how uh, God imprints himself on us, how we're made in his image. The ones after that talk a little bit more about relationally, how we connect with one another. We're not supposed to covet, we're not supposed to bear false witness, right? These types of things. These first verses, though, talk about how we are to not create idols, not create other images as gods or images and replace the image of God. He says, you're image bearers. And that goes back to Genesis again, 1 and 2. God made mankind, male and female, in his image. And so it's important for us to, to make that distinction. Coming out of Egypt, where they had many gods, and Pharaoh himself was God, Ra, the, the God, their sun gods, and all these different gods for the things that they encountered from day to day, 
They're coming into Sinai and this encounter with God, and God says, don't do that. Just, just don't create things to try to bear my image. You are my image bearers. And he, he keeps hammering away at this because the tendency, human tendency, is to create something, something physical, something present to hold on to and go, God is in this, or we'll worship this, or this will represent God for us before the peoples. In fact, we, we, won't, we won't go there, but while, uh, while Moses is giving these, you know, he's on the mountain, and he's getting all of these instructions about worship and about community life and, and don't create images and call them God. And down at the base of the mountain are the people. And they're doing what? Creating. They're creating an idol. <laughs> they're creating this golden calf, right? And they're taking all the gold items, their earrings and whatever gold they have, melting it and they're creating a calf. And they're like, let's create something that will represent God, and it will go before us. And this is what the nations will see. This will be our God. And so they do this. They have a big party, a um, big festival going on, and it, it doesn't go well. We'll just leave it at that. So this is the human tendency. Let's, let's attach God's name to something other than us identify as image bearers of our Creator. I want us to jump over to, uh, well, I want to highlight um, this idea. God's instructions around idols and images is intended to help us keep the right perspective of who God is and who we are. Yeah, it's great that we put the Ten Commandments on the wall. It's even better when it's written on our heart. <laughs> and we understand that it's not intended to be laws that keep us rule-abiding people but it's intended to bring us into the life that God intends us to live. So, to hold on to this rule, okay, don't make, and there's many religions that do this, right? Christian uh, sects and other groups that really hardline, don't, you can't have a picture of Jesus on the wall because that's creating an image. Well, kind of, it depends on what you're doing with that image. I know many loving Christians who love Jesus, who have an image of what they believe or what the artist believes is an image like what Jesus would look like, and they're not worshiping it. It's, it's not their idol. It's just a, an image to remind them of Jesus' presence in their, in their life. So we can get really rules-oriented and really legalistic about these things when the intent behind it was God was saying, you need a right perspective of who I am and who you are. I don't want you to create a thing and see my image in it. I don't want you to create a thing and worship it as though you're worshiping me. I want you to know me. I will be your God and you will be my people. So the instruction, God's instructions around idols and images is intended to help us keep that right perspective. We are created to mirror God's image in our lives, but our tendency, again, is to try to have God mirror human and earthly images. It's just part of what we're drawn to, is to ascribe God's image onto someone or something else. Let's jump over to 1 Corinthians 1, 18-25, because Paul addresses a similar thing in the church in Corinth, and I, I want us to try to make this, this bridge of... How those images change from generation to generation, from uh, one era to another. First Corinthians 1, 18 to 25, Paul is addressing the church in Corinth, a church that was really spiritual in the sense of having spiritual gifts, spiritual knowledge, a deep understanding from their perspective of, of spiritual matters, uh, but, but Paul comes and he, he shares this with them. He says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased 
through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block for Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. I make this jump over to New Testament, Paul speaking to the church in Corinth. Paul's addressing a people who have certain things that need to happen in order for them to believe, that God needs to demonstrate himself in this way. For the Greeks, the intellect, show yourself as being smart, God. <laughs> show yourself as being reasonable and worth following. To the Jews, show us a sign. Show us that you're present. Show us that you're doing something active in the earth today. Paul, addressing the church in Corinth, says, God's not responding to you wanting to see him do something to prove himself, but God wants to show you Christ, him crucified, that he is the answer for the wisdom that the Greeks seek, and he is the sign for the answer that the Jews seek, that prove yourself <coughs> And neither of them will be satisfied. Death on the cross of Christ, death on the cross is, is not a sign that the Jews would say, oh, God's proved himself that he, he is with us. And to the Greeks, they would see the death of Jesus truly as foolish, ridiculous, that that would somehow bring about God's purposes and his plans, redemption. And yet this is God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. These things, every, as I said, every era, every generation, something gets elevated. Among the Greeks, it was wisdom, the philosophies of the age, and how you could talk about something that's elevated. And this, you could convince somebody into a knowledge of who God, who God is. For the Jews, the signs, something spiritual that would reveal that God is, God is among us. <coughs> not seeing God in the image of Christ, not seeing God as he reveals himself in Jesus. Jesus, the perfect image of the Father in human form. When we see Jesus, we don't just see God in the flesh, we, we do that. But we also see, because God is, Jesus is perfectly God, Jesus is perfectly human. So we see God in the flesh, we also see a human serving God in perfection. Jesus fully man. What does it look like when a human is fully alive in the Father, living in in perfect obedience to the Father's direction, and perfectly imaging the Father in human flesh. So we look at Genesis chapters 1 and 2, right? You will bear my image. You people, male, female, you'll bear my image. And we see one after another fail to bear the image in a way that we go, oh, that's kind of ugly. <laughs> that's, that's not a good picture of God in humanity. And then the next generation, oh, that one murdered, that, mm, that's bad. Oh, okay, that one took authority and power and used it to crush other people. That's not a good picture. And one after another, we just see humanity abuse this image of God in such a way that it, it makes it corrupt or bent. You look and you just go, I, I don't see God in that. I don't see the beauty of our creator in that person and it just keeps going down the line until Jesus. And when Jesus comes, born of the Spirit through Mary, the perfect human, sinless, he is bearing the image of the Father in perfection. And we finally get to see what it looks like when a human bears God's image in perfection. And it is beautiful. And it is amazing when Jesus prays, he prays on point. When he speaks, he speaks the words of the Father. And what, what brings to life the invitation to come into the kingdom. And people find him irresistible. 
what he has to say and what he teaches. In fact, they say, nobody's ever taught as this one is, is taught. What is this? How he teaches? And he teaches with such authority. And what does he do? And he brings people up. The low he raises up. The high. He says, careful. Watch out. You're a bad image bearer when you're using your power to abuse those below you. So Jesus calls out injustice. He calls out ways that other humans are, are not bearing the image of the Father, but are abusing others instead. And so in Jesus, we see the perfect image of the Father. We would not be so foolish as to worship creatures made of wood and metal. Instead, we elevate the idols and images of human wisdom, power, and progress. How, how many of us read the story about the, the Israelites and we just see, you know, Moses getting the commandments, and then they melt down the gold, and they say, let's make a calf. Let's worship this animal, and, and it'll be the image of God for us. I mean, how many of you look at that and go, really? <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's a great image there you got there, you know. That's not real spectacular, you know. You just kind of laugh, I mean... You see, and, and it just seems silly, doesn't it? I mean, that a, a piece of metal, a, a stick, a wood idol, that you just kind of go, really, that's your God? <laughs> that, that, that's, that's so small, it really doesn't count for anything. And yet, as I was putting together the message, I was thinking, you know, an idol preserved and taken well care of could last generations. The idols that we tend to make that come out of rugged individualism, idols that we make about power and progress, oftentimes are gone within a generation or less. The idols that we make and we prop up in our culture are sometimes even more temporary than a piece of metal or wood. They're here today and then they're gone tomorrow. Ways that we try to bear God's image in our things, in our own likeness, as opposed to us being image bearers of Him. I want to highlight just this morning before we go to communion, I want to highlight just some of the things that we might be enticed to put God's image on and have that represent Him in place of us being image bearers. And I think this is really important as we come out of a time of Easter where Jesus makes the invitation, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden, burdened down, heavy yokes, cumbersome life. Jesus says, come to me. Receive of me. Right? Receive the life I have for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The invitation that Jesus makes to us is to set us free. And my sense is that what can happen is we exchange these images of God and being image bearers on his behalf and the life he has for us and we put it on other things and other people and they become really rough masters to us. They become really difficult to defend and they demand more of us than we even realize. So let me begin just by highlighting real quick three that are, I believe, gods of the ages. These gods are ones that have existed throughout time and they'll continue to exist until Christ returns. Wealth, power, and sensuality. Right? These, these always exist. These have existed throughout all ages. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time with these, but these are ways that people look to serve. They are masters that people serve, ways that people say, God is in these things. He's in my wealth. I, I'm, I know God is with me because I have a lot of uh, good is happening to me. And, and this isn't just in the Christian faith. This is across the board. But boy, I've heard this a lot of times. Like, if, if you got all the good stuff, that means God's favor is on you. So good job. Like, you're serving God well. Well, the problem is Jesus had no home. <laughs> Jesus wandered about without a home from 
place to place, he slept on borrowed beds, and so that would suggest that Jesus wasn't favored because he didn't have a lot of wealth. And we see this all throughout church history. It's repeated over and over. Uh, is it, does God provide for us? Absolutely. Is God's grace upon us? Absolutely. And in the New Testament, it talks about that too. That we, we should not desire to become wealthy because the love of money, not money, the love of money corrupts and it causes all types of pains in our life when we pursue money as a form of God's blessing over our life. God blesses us, God provides for us, but money is a pursuit and the way to image God and say, this is God's image. When there's blessing, all of a sudden I say, that's where God is, he's with the wealth. God would say, no, that's not where he's at. <laughs> and in fact, Jesus lowly and serving, is, is wealth evil? No, wealth is not inherently evil. It is the heart that comes with it, and it's the idea of trying to say God is here in the midst of wealth. That's not God's image. It's not found in wealth. It's not found in power. This is one that throughout the ages, people try to attach God to. God, if God is with you, then you're going to ascend to the highest place, and you will have great power that will allow you to influence everybody else. And that's not really what we see in Scripture either. You see, look at the Israelite people. They were the lowliest of low of peoples in their, in their community. And God took care of them. God shows himself. Actually, the reverse is true. God shows himself through weakness. This is the testimony, is that we know God is behind something. How many times did you go, how did that happen? Right? That must have been God. Well, if you could do it and I could do it, what do we need God for? So the testimony of Christians throughout history has been, we haven't been the most powerful, we haven't been the greatest. In fact, Paul talks about this in the same very verse, the same verse that I read earlier. None of us were really, you know, well-to-do. None of us were popular. None of us were influential. But God demonstrated his wisdom through the lowest of things, right? And so the same with power. We tend to think people, human nature tends to say, let's attach God's image to power, that God will take the high seat and the most authority, and he will cause others to have to get beneath him. The model that Jesus give us, gives us as an image bearer of God is he comes in low, and he is the servant of all. This is challenging for us. But these are the gods of the ages, and this is how God counters that. The last one is sensuality. This is the age-old philosophy. If it feels good, do it. <laughs> And, and so sensuality shows itself in many different ways, many different forms, but it is a God that elevates itself, and people try to say, well, God created this, our senses, and so how could anything that gives me pleasure be bad? Well, pleasure itself is not the God, and we don't attach God's image to that. Yes, God created our senses, but it's not the image bearer of God. It is something for us to delight in, in the presence and in the confines of God's holiness and what he desires for us. So those are just big, three big top label ones, but I want to address, for the remaining little bit of time I have, I want to address the ones that are, we're tempted to in this present age to say, this is how God shows himself. This is how I know that God is present, is by identifying or attaching God's image to these things. The first one is individualism. Boy, this is a God of our day. Individualism. I can do what I want. I can live life on my terms. And nobody or nothing should impede me in my individual pursuits. Now, this is really difficult for us, particularly in America, because this is a little bit of the image of how we see ourselves, is the rugged individualism that we don't need anyone or anything. We will make a way and we'll create the life that we want. What it fails to, to miss or, or doesn't acknowledge is submission to God, and that God is the one who directs the path of a life. That we all, our steps are all directed by God. 
And it's all dependent upon other things around us. So this individualism and raising that up fails to recognize that we're part of a community. We're part of something more than just ourselves. We're part of families. How did you get to where you're at? Part of it was family. Part of it was, the if you're married, part of it is the family that you married into. Jerry and I were just talking about this yesterday. Uh, just, I don't know if you ever go down these what-if scenarios, but we met in... Uh, 1987, I graduated high school and went to um, Bible college out in Los Angeles. She was coming back. She had taken a year off from college. And we met each other, and, and uh, about a year later, we started, we started dating. And we started kind of going down this, this rabbit trail, not, not too far, because it seemed like a, a place that we, did, we didn't know the end of it, of course. But we started thinking, what if... We never, I never asked you out on a date. What if, you know, what if I decided not to go to Bible school and you did and then you married somebody else and, and, uh, and what would life look like? Did you ever do those what if scenarios yet? Just kind of as a, it's like, wow, you know, I, I, I said, I don't think I ever would have ended up in Grand Junction or church planting in Kansas City. That was kind of her influence through her family. There was a connection there. So this wouldn't be part of my life at all, and we wouldn't have the same kids, and so that wouldn't look the same, right? You start seeing how one decision, one decision starts changing, even the imprinting, and, and she mentioned, oh yeah, because the way that you've discipled in my life and the way you've shaped who I am, and even you know, my family, how it's shaped who you are and how you've grown. Right? It, it, it starts getting a little bit fuzzy out there, right? The farther you carry that out. But I'm bringing this up because when we say that we're rugged individualists and the God of individualists and we print God's image on individualism, we fail to realize that God is at work in every one of our lives and He is accomplishing a task far greater than we would ever have capacity to accomplish. The person I am, the person you are, is not the product of your own doing. It is the way in which God has worked in your life, good or bad, allowing things to come into your life or directing or facilitating things to happen in your life in such a way that you have become, and your responses have allowed you to become the person that you are. You are not just an individualist. You are part of something far bigger than just your individual choices. You're part of God's plan and what he has for you, the family that you grew up in, the person you married, the community you're a part of, the friends that you've made. It's far bigger than you. So this God of the day, I would say, no, you're not just an individual plucked down and making your own way. As an image bearer of God, how much freedom should that bring you? Not, not that God's holding strings on you, but that God has a purpose and a plan that you can trust. And as you lean into it and allow him to shape your life through the people that you're in community with, what a difference that makes. The second one is life without limits. Oh, this is tough. And I'm not just talking about the culture out there. I'm talking about us. This is what we're challenged with, life without limits. right? That, that I can go, 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 and I don't ever have to slow down. Oftentimes, it's illness that causes us to put on the brakes. Have you ever said this, you get a cold or you get the flu, maybe even something more severe? Have you ever said these words? I laugh and I even say it myself. I, I've got too much to do to be sick. <laughs> have, have you ever said those words? As though somehow you're a machine that can just blow through any circumstances around you and you can't be impeded because you have too much to accomplish. This is what God was breaking in the people of Israel who have learned you don't get to take a break. God says, no, now you do. You take a Sabbath. You need to pause because you're not a machine, you're a human. And your body doesn't just go, go, go. I've created you to rest. And when you rest, you have time to reflect and mirror my image. 
And so this life without limits, it's not just physically the way that we work, but the way that we enjoy or indulge ourselves. We now have, you know, when I was younger, there was the 12 channels. I know, so we're going back a few years. But there was 12 channels on the screen, 13 maybe, and then you. I never knew what you was, but then the end with the other dial, and you clicked it around. And then the rabbit ears let you tune in to how many channels were local to you. So maybe five. I got that in the community of Bend, Oregon, growing up, had about five channels pre-cable. And so that was your entertainment. And then it went dark at uh, 11 at night. You know, they played the national anthem, and then the screen, you just saw fuzz. <laughs> that was the screen. There was nothing on. And you just thought, okay, well, I guess entertainment's over. That's it. <laughs> And he just waited until morning, 7, 6 a.m., 7 in the morning, especially Saturdays, to turn on cartoons. And then I loved that until around 10 o'clock, and an American bandstand came on, and my brother and sister, they wanted to watch that. And I was like, I guess entertainment's over. I don't want to watch people dancing to, to music. That's stupid. So cartoons are over. So i got to move on to something else. There was limits, right, in that. And, and so we'd have to learn to adapt to what those limits are. We continually progress towards a day and an age without limits. More and more where you don't have to have limits. Now Jerry and I want to watch a series on Netflix or some other Hulu, whatever. We turn on that series. We can we can blow through six in an evening. Like, you know, we could watch, we could we could go longer, but you know, we hit midnight and we're kind of like, yeah, I guess it's time to go to bed, stop watching. Right? Binge watching is a thing. It's been a thing for a while. Binge watch. We incorporate it into our language. Binge eating. Binge watching. You know, whatever you want to attach it to. Life without limits. This is a challenge. This is a world in which we, we live in. It's incredibly freeing to have so much accessible to us at our hands. But that means that we can't just say, I don't have to live with any limits because I'm enjoying what it is that I'm doing. And if I'm enjoying it, that must be God, right? If I'm delighting in it, God must be present in it. No, God invites us to live with limits. But the gods of the day would say, you don't need limits. You get to enjoy whatever you want as much as you want. The last one is comfort without cost. Gods of the day would just say that you, you need to pursue this to, to find what's meaningful to you, to whatever brings you comfort, then pursue that, whatever the cost might be. In fact, often the term cost gets removed, that there shouldn't be a cost to anything. It should, everything should just bring, come to me without any type of cost at all. The reality is, there's always a price to be paid. And Jesus taught us that. Jesus said, listen, nobody, nobody goes to war without first looking to see that they have what's needed to go to war. There's a cost to be paid. Parents, you know this well. Rest comes at a cost, doesn't it? You make choices. If you've ever been a parent, you know that you're giving up one thing to attend to another. When the schedule gets squeezed, it's, do I get time with my child for this moment, or do I sneak in a rest while the other parent or somebody else watches? And the guilt that can come along with that. There's a cost. The culture of the day just says things, you know, you don't have to pay the cost. You, you can find comfort, you can find a pathway to receiving comfort and let somebody else cover that. Somebody else do it. But ultimately, all of us, when we receive comfort, when we experience comfort, there's a cost. We want to image God at finding a pathway to being soothed and comforted apart from experiencing life with God. We want to find comfort in things, in other ways of living life, living it on our terms, without God. But then we're surprised when there's a cost that's attached to that. 
in this moment as we come to communion this morning I want to point us back to the invitation that Jesus makes us I believe every generation wants God to be revealed in their images but God revealed himself in Christ Jesus the power of God, the wisdom of God the fullness of God in humanity this year in particular, an election year, right, we're going to hear so much about this stuff of, of how do we, you know, how do we find what we want in life? Who's going to bring to us the life that we want? Who's more capable? Which party is more capable of delivering the life that we want? My encouragement to us, especially in this type of year, is to not embrace the images of the world around us, to not allow ourselves to be imprinted and, or take God and say, this is God's blessing here and this is what good God looks like here, but to be able to say, I'm an image bearer of Christ and God has shown his blessing in what life looks like fully alive in Christ Jesus. And so when we look for God, is God moving, is God working, then we don't look for the economy to be God's blessing. We don't look for societal uh, activities to be God's blessing. We don't look for a leader of our nation to be God's blessing. We say God is an image bearer and he bears his image on us. And we get to show forth who he is and what it looks like when God reveals himself in people. We get to see Jesus, the fullness of life of God, the, the wisdom of God revealed in Christ Jesus. This is the invitation that he makes us. Can I encourage you this morning? I have two questions. And worship team, if you'll come up, we'll finish with this. Two questions to reflect on as we prepare for communion. And now, ushers, if you'll come forward also and begin distributing uh, communion to the, to the church. How is Jesus and the kingdom of God being revealed in ways contrary to the world? That's the first question. How do you see Jesus and the kingdom of God being revealed in ways that are contrary to the world? In other words, the world is trying to bear an image. Jesus is revealing himself in ways often that are so contrary to what we see around us. And then the second, what human or earthly images have you put God's image on? Is there a way that you have tried to say God's blessing is here? Or I want to attach God to this. I want God to be revealed through this earthly person or this thing. I want people to see God's image through this activity. And God is saying, I want people to see my image through you. Who you are. I want somebody to be able to look at your life and see the activity of God and say, oh, that's what it looks like when God reveals himself. Now, I realize it's not going to be perfect in me. It's not going to be perfect in you. But, but here's one thing I love about Paul's statement when he says, follow me as I follow Christ. There's a, there's a point where Paul makes that invitation to uh, the church that he's writing to. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. And at first look, I, I read that and I was like, well... That's kind of puffed up and arrogant. <laughs> right? You think you're that big of a deal, you know, Paul? You think you don't make mistakes? You, you think everybody should just do, you know, discipleship like you do discipleship? And as time went on and I thought about that scripture, I thought, actually, Paul really has it right. He's somebody who's pursuing Christ and he's making the invitation for those around him to say, follow my life. And do the things I do as I follow Jesus. And that means at some point, 
I'm going to have to confess and repent and receive forgiveness because I'm not perfect. That's a great thing to be able to observe, right? If you have people in your life who think that, well, you know, I couldn't be a Christian because I don't do everything perfect. Well, one of the best things for them to see is for you to mess up. <laughs> and I shouldn't say it's the best thing for them to see. But it's, it's a helpful thing for them to see. You mess up and then you go, man, I blew it. That was so not the image of God right there. That was that was me. That was me trying to be something and someone I'm not and, and something apart from what God would have. If you're a parent, that's so healthy and good for your kids to see you go, you know, I had this recently where I overreacted. Personally, I overreacted to one of my kids and, and um, said something too strong. And I could tell it just kind of push too hard on them and push back. It was just a too, too big of a response for the interaction. And I slept on it overnight and I woke up in the morning and it was still with me. I was like, yep, that was too much. And so we just had this conversation and I just had to say, I'm, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? You know, I messed up. That, that wasn't Jesus-like. That wasn't the right way to respond to that. So when Paul makes the invitation, follow me as I follow Christ, it's the invitation that you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you can make that same statement. Follow me as I follow Jesus. But on the heels of that, you have to be willing to say, that means I'm going to do my best to image God as best I can. That means I'm going to be compassionate. I'm going to follow the way of Jesus in such a way that I'm recognized I'm not perfect in this. And I'm willing to confess repent, and be transparent about that when I do that. So that's that second question. What human or earthly images have you put God's image on? Are there people or things that you keep trying to attach? Uh, the last time we had an election, I had a number of folks, not, not a lot, numbers too exaggerated, I had, I had a small number of folks who said, Pastor, aren't you going to endorse one of these people? Aren't you going to say, you know, this is what you should do? And I said, uh, no, I'm not. Because neither of them are image bearers of Christ. They don't represent God for the church. So, like, if I say, this is God's man, <laughs> you know, what, I, what I'm doing is saying, yeah, this person is going to lead you into the fullness of life, what Jesus wants, or lead this nation in the fullness of life of what God wants for, for you and for this nation. And that's not true. What God wants, this is much more scary, right? What God wants, how God is going to lead this nation and your community into the fullness of what God wants to be an image bearer of Him in this country is you, is His church, His body. Those who follow Jesus. We are the image bearers of God. Not in an arrogant sense, but if revival of change is going to happen in your community, it's not because somebody from the top says, do this. It's because the person across the street encounters Christ through you and their life has changed because you're an image bearer of God. So the temptation, I get it, I understand it's so tempting to say, God's image is on this person. And so this is, this is how God's moving is on this. We do it with pastors and church leaders too. God's moving this way. And this is how God... You're an image bearer. And those Christian leaders are one expression of God's bearing God's image. And, and so it's important that you see God rightly. In scripture, that you see yourself rightly, and that we don't try to attach him to other things. But we just say, Lord, thank you for making me an image bearer. Help me to live it fully. Help me to be open to invite others to say, Follow me as I follow Christ. I want you to see what it looks like to bear his image in this life. And I want to grow fully in